that's good. Well, look, it's right on 10 o'clock, folks. We've got a good roll up today. So, and uh, as usual, uh, many thanks to, uh, to Peter, who's going to be recording it. And um, I was hoping today that uh, Lance would come on as well. I sent him an email and uh, Peter was saying that uh, after his presentation on the Phantom, in only three days, there was uh, 237 hits. So that's, that says a lot. So Peter's, um, so thanks very much, Peter, for, um, no for letting us know that and uh, for getting out, getting the airport story out there, Oz and Lords, it's a great sight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, today we have a great pleasure of having um, Air Commodore Mark Lax join us uh, uh, to give a, give a presentation. Uh, he would be very familiar to, to all of you, I'm sure. Um, 45 year career in the in the permanent and reserve air force, and of course uh, a real overachiever when it comes to uh, writing uh, books on history puts us all to shame. Uh, part of his canon includes from controversy to cutting edge the story of the F111, uh, which has been a terrific um, a terrific uh, bestseller. Um, story of uh, 454 Squadron, um, the, the history of uh, East Sail. Wings over Mesopotamia and Iraq, 1940-18. Gestapo Hunters, 464 Squadron, Great Read. Uh, and of course, he's just recently published his work on the uh, the RAF in the Malayan emergency. And uh, as I said in my uh, email that I sent out, uh, all round good bloke and uh, one of the examiners for my PhD. I, and I always think he helps help strengthen it. So thanks very much. And, and I'm sorry once again for all the typos, sir. Uh, but you know, thanks to you, we might all made it. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Air Commodore Lax. Oh, thanks very much, Marianne, and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Thanks for joining me. Um, I did one of these quite some time ago on women in the Air Force, and uh, I don't know how many hits the YouTube got, but I got a call from the Middle East. So, <laughs> we believe it or not. So, these things do go everywhere. So, anyway, welcome, welcome uh, to the Milan Emergency and Confrontation. I'm going to share my screen and talk to some slides. Now, there's not too much to read. The reading bits are for me to read and keep me on track rather than for you to try and read. So bear with me in that case. Um, so hopefully we'll get cracking. Now, you should see the Malayan Emergency and Confrontation. I'm not sure how long this will take, but if you, if you get bored, you can tune out. I don't mind, but I'm going to crackle on anyway. Uh, this came, this presentation Marianne asked me to do some time ago. Um, the Air Force, about a year back, asked me to do a, um, a booklet or a book on the Malayan Emergency and Confrontation, focusing on the, the RAF elements. There's been lots and lots written about the Army, a little bit about the Navy, but not too much about the Air Force. So this is sort of the presentation I put together from, from what ended up being one of the campaign series which the Air Force has published. Um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the passing of Air Commodore Graham Dyke. Um, he died last week. We, uh, we attended his funeral virtually yesterday, so we're here in Canberra. Uh, he was a Lincoln pilot, and he actually gave me a lot of help with this, so vale to Graham Dyke. Um, I was going to start by little things that people have asked me about. Is it Malaya or is it Malaysia? Um, in a way, it's both, but for the Malayan emergency, it's Malaya. Uh, Malaya got its independence from the British in 1957, but it didn't amalgamate the British states of Sarawak and Sabah until 1963, when it formally became Malaysia. So you'll find that when people talk about the Malayan emergency, it's Malaya, and if they talk about confrontation, it's Malaysia. And of course, you should be familiar with that part of the world. We all are. Um, the map shows the two parts to Malaysia, and um, we're going to be talking about both parts today. And I'll come back to um, what's known as East Malaysia when we get to the confrontation bit. Um, so let's talk about the Malayan emergency first. Um, 16th of June, 48 to the 12th of July, 1960. Uh, many pundits out there think it went longer than that. Um, but I'm really going to concentrate on this period as the official dates for the emergency. Um, it all started on the, um, in June 1948 when uh, three plantation owners, British plantation owners in the north part of um, Malaya, near, up near the Thai border, were murdered by, um, they thought they were bandits, they thought they were gangsters. Turns out they were 
communist terrorists uh, who'd started the uprising. And this is the um, house where um, two of the plantation owners were strapped to chairs and um, murdered. And that sparked off the emergency. Um, fomented by this chap in the middle, um, Chin Peng, with a couple of his comrades. Uh, there was peace talks in 1955 where he came out of the jungle. Uh, the peace talks failed. Uh, but this is one of the pictures we have of him at that time. Quite a young man, joined the Communist Party fairly on, the Communist Party of Malaya, and rose to become the Secretary General. So he's basically the leader of the gang. Um, now, there's a bit of politics we need to cover before we talk about the Air Force, and it's important you understand that because it was a changing feast. Um, the Malayan Communist Party was founded in the late 20s, uh, and it continued on right through till you know, the, um, almost the late 80s. Uh, but it changed its names to meet the political circumstances of the time. Uh, when the Japanese invaded, uh, the British supported uh, these guys because it was the only formed group that could offer any sort of resistance to the Japanese. So the British actually parachuted um, uh, aid, weapons, ammunition and advisors into the jungles to train them. So in a way, the Brits brought this on themselves because they actually trained up the people who would later fight against them. Once the um, Japanese had been defeated and the British came back into um, Peninsula Malaya, Malaya uh, they changed their name to the People's Anti-British Army. Um, and then because that only really attracted the Chinese elements of the mixed race population of Malaya, they then decided they should try to expand it to the um, Malayan and the Indian uh, races as well, and they changed the name to the Malayan National Liberation Army, with the idea that they could probably encourage more people to join. At the same time, they established the Min Wen. Uh, that was the civilian element of their um, their army. That would be all the people, particularly in the jungle fringes and in the kampongs, uh, who would be Chinese in origin and would support them through food uh, and, and intelligence and so forth. Uh, and that group lasted until 1989 when a peace treaty was formally signed. Um, so what did these guys want to do? Well, as they were the Malayan National Liberation Army, they really wanted to kick out the Brits and establish a communist state in Malaya. And how would they do that? There was a three-pronged sort of approach. Uh, they caused terror and economic chaos, uh, which they certainly started to do by 1949. It was well underway. They wanted to liberate selected uh, rural areas and establish local communist administration uh, with a communist um, organization set up there. And then they would move on to liberate the urban areas, uh, including Singapore and Penang uh, and Malacca. And uh, that would be their final part of their three phases. Now, in the end, they really only managed to achieve the first part of that, um, of those three pronged approach, uh, but it took well, 10, 10 years or more to stop them. So 12, in fact. Um, so there was a lot of propaganda that went out on both sides and it became as much a propaganda war as it was a, a military operation as well as a civilian policing operation. And um, Chin Peng himself decided later in life that he didn't get killed in the, in the um, emergency. He escaped to Thailand. Uh, he he wrote himself his own side of the story, uh, which is a very interesting book if you've ever read it. It's quite different to what we know from the Western views, and it always is. Um, and it was printed in Singapore, which is quite bizarre. But anyway, that's the way it is. And there was a, a lot of leaflet dropping propaganda uh, issued around the jungle fringes and so forth. Uh, and partly due to the effort that the Air Force put in, particularly Dakotas and Osters, by throwing out thousands and thousands of these leaflets. So there's just a couple of examples. Some of them offered safe conduct. So if you handed yourself in, you'd be treated well, you'd be given food and, and uh, helped to repatriate. Um, it was a civil commotion. And uh, consequently, the emergency, as it was called, was essentially a police action with military support. Now, why was it called an emergency and not a war? It was all about protecting British plantation and uh, plantation owners and farmers uh, from their insurance claims, because had it been a war, uh, any damage to rubber trees or um, 
plantation property would not have been paid. It's the old fine print in the bottom of your insurance policy that says wars, nuclear explosions, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are not covered. So essentially that was um, why it was called an emergency uh, and uh, it continued to be so. And it was fought in the Malayan villages, um, mostly on the jungle fringes that anybody's actually been to Malaysia, uh, even today, although they've got highways cut through all this stuff, the jungle areas and the mountain areas are pretty impenetrable. And it was the jungle areas where the communist terrorists uh, had their refuge and had their camps. And so consequently, that's where much of the fighting was. And it was fought in the Malayan jungle. And that's a sort of a picture of some of it. Uh, it's pretty thick. You can actually take a whole day to go just a few hundred yards with a machete and an ax just to cut your way through it. So finding small groups of um, terrorists hidden in camps in the middle of the jungle was extremely difficult. Um, the Australian Army participated. Uh, elements of 1, 2 and 3 RAR rotated between 55 and 59. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, their operations, but they were certainly um, part of the Australian government's um, assistance to the nascent um, Malayan and British governments in, in Malaya. And that was part of the Far East Strategic Reserve, which I'll briefly cover. And so did the Navy. Um, they sent um, patrol boats and destroyer escorts. Uh, mainly to patrol around the coastal areas to stop communist reinforcement, whether it be supplies, weapons, personnel, and so forth. Um, I don't know so much about whether they achieved that, but uh, the reading suggests that there was not too much that was sent by sea. Um, a lot of stuff was smuggled in through the Thai Malayan border. So I won't talk much more about the, the Navy as well. Now, you have to understand how this was all organised. Um, the chap on the left there, looking fairly smart and with his spaghetti hat and his, his um, medals is Frederick Scherger, who was at the time was the AOC in Malaya. Uh, and the fellow he's talking to is uh, Malcolm MacDonald, who was the Commissioner General for Southeast Asia in the early part of the emergency. And consequently, he was responsible for uh, all British political, uh, economic and um, uh, basically military operations in Southeast Asia, as it was back then, the, certainly the British parts. So he was fairly powerful, uh, an ex-MP. It was one of those um, parachute jobs he'd been put into. Not that it happens in Australia, of course, when you retire from politics, you don't become, of course, you don't become an ambassador. No, of course you don't. But similar in, that, in those days to, to what happened. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but basically he sits at the top of the tree and there's land, um, uh, High Commissioner and Director of Operations, I'll talk about Sir Gerald in a minute, and the Commander-in-Chief Far East Air Force, um, who was a British Air Marshal, and he was responsible not just for Malaya and Singapore, but also for um, Ceylon, uh, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, Burma and so forth. Uh, but I'm only going to talk about the uh, connection with Malaya, and I'm not sure how clear that picture is, but basically, there's a fairly large military top-heavy organisation, but the position of um, High Commissioner and Director of Operations was a two-hatted job. Uh, and that um, came into being in about 1951, and I'll explain why. So I'm not going to talk about any more flow diagrams, only to say that it was a fairly complex command and control arrangement, uh, but the civilian um, authorities had primacy and a lot of uh, emphasis was placed upon police operations and police intelligence. Um, once the emergency started, the British sent out Sir Henry Gurney. Um, he was a career public servant, bureaucrat. Uh, he became the High Commissioner. Uh, and in that period, as the emergency gathered pace, uh, he wasn't quite uh, aware of the fact that it wasn't just a bunch of thugs and bandits causing mayhem. Uh, he didn't quite grasp the fact that it was a complete uprising and would to continue to get worse. And uh, consequently, uh, his ideas were to just treat them as if they were criminals. Uh, and consequently, uh, not too much was done in the early days, although it started to build up towards 1951. Uh, sadly, he was assassinated in an ambush. Um, that's his actual car. And you can see the, uh, he was sprayed with bullets. Um, and sadly, the, he was driving up to the Cameron Highlands uh, to go and visit a, a group of terrorists who had offered to surrender. I don't know why he was doing it, but he was doing that. 
And somewhere along the road, another group who didn't know that that was the case, jumped out in front of his car uh, and sprayed it with bullets. And for some strange reason, um, the driver wasn't immediately killed, but they stopped. And so the communists just pumped the car full of, um, full of rounds and uh, he was assassinated. So that finally shook the British to realizing this was more than just a gang of thugs that were running around the bush. And they ended up sending Sir Harold Briggs. And he became the director of operations because they realized they needed a military man. And Sir Harold was a Lieutenant General who'd served in the British Army during the war and also had in Palestine during their troubles in the 1940s, late 40s. And so they appointed him as director of operations to be in direct liaison with the British civil authorities. And consequently, he came up with a plan which is still known as the Briggs Plan uh, in terms of how he would manage this. And the first thing he decided to do was completely reorganize the British, British and Malayan police force uh, the police force at the time was uh, mostly um, Malayan constables on the ground, but a British hierarchy managing it. And he wanted to reorganise it along the lines of a British bobby, uh, a people's friend rather than some sort of oppressor for the, for the uh, local population. Um, he needed to create an effective intelligence, Indigenous intelligence system. Uh, the only way they were going to find out what was happening was to ask the local people, uh, both the local Aboriginal people who lived in the jungle areas, the Orang Asli, and also particularly the Chinese on the fringes and also the ones in the cities, the main cities who were their source of funding. So they needed to create that and conducting the SAI operations, as I mentioned, which included leaflet drops, offering rewards, offering amnesty and so forth. And that was well broadcast. However, Sir Harold Briggs was um, not a well man and he uh, only lasted a couple of years because he retired to Cyprus and within 12 months he'd passed on, uh, unfortunately. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so he was replaced by Sir Gerald Templer, uh, General, General uh, Sir Gerald Templer, who became known as the Tiger of Malaya. Um, he refined the Briggs plan and uh, his aims were to kill CTs and keep them on the move. And keeping them on the move is important because we'll come back to that. And by doing that, you would increase the chances of them being either killed by the uh, forces on the ground or captured. Um, he wanted to disrupt their bases and their organization, lower their morale, induce surrender, and insist, assist uh, food denial by crop destruction. And here's where we start to hear about things like spraying of foliage to defoliants. We heard about it in Vietnam, which was widespread during the Vietnam War, but it was also used to some success in Malaya. And they'd use osters fitted with um, tanks of, of uh, uh, plant killing chemicals. And they'd run up and down the riverbanks and spray the, the um, patches of food growing because they could see where the food was being growing near the water. And so that was quite effective. Uh, not as widespread as we know from Vietnam where the Americans you know, dropped defoliant on acres and acres. This was quite... Um, quite targeted. So that was General um, Sir Gerald Templer's plan. And um, there's an example of the propaganda leaflet. And this just shows the idea of how they started what they call black and white areas. And it's not a really clear picture, but you can see from the time starting on the left, as the time went on, um, the white areas, which were cleared of CTs, got larger and larger, and the black areas, which were still um, uncleared, uh, reduced. And that uh, last one on the right is probably in about 1954 uh, when things start to play out. Um, I don't expect you to read all this. This is a chart that's in the, in the book, but basically you can see down the left there's red, orange and green sections. Red was the, uh, the, the timing from 48 to 51 when most of the serious incidents and murders occurred. Uh, and uh, 52 to 54 when it stabilized and then started to drop and from 55 to 58, it diminished considerably. Um, but what struck me was the number of communist terrorist casualties, that's killed, captured, or wounded, um, estimated at about 9,500, was almost equivalent to the number of security forces casualties and the number of civilian casualties. Um, so you know, what can you make of that? You can make it as being an even split, but uh, certainly it was not by any means just a few bandits running around the jungle. Okay. Um, that's the sort of political situation. And I sort of needed to cover that because it, it, it plays a very important part in how the Air Force uh, was used, deployed in, uh, in Malaya. And we really had a little bit more than just a whole bunch of Lincolns 
uh, the first in were the Dakotas uh, from 38 Squadron. Uh, they spent a couple of years there, but they were pretty much pulled out because of demands of the Korean War and demands of um, transport operations at home. So they did their bit and they did a really good job for the timing they were there. But just after they were arrived, the Lincolns were, um, were sent to Malaya and they went to Tanga, which is an airfield in Singapore. And they basically spent the next eight years doing um, anti-terrorist bombing operations, which I'll cover shortly. Um, towards the end of that phase, the Lincolns were withdrawn. Uh, the Sabres of 3 Squadron and then later 77 Squadron uh, turned up uh, and they were based in Butterworth. And of course, I don't want to forget two squadron Canberra's also Butterworth were based from 58. And the reason they weren't based in Butterworth a lot earlier was the airfield was not in the fair state for more advanced jet aircraft. Uh, and I'll come to what we did about that shortly. Okay, so what did the air headquarters in uh, Malaya, which was essentially run by an AOC and it alternated between an Australian and a Brit, um, what did what roles were they? And I'll just let you read that whilst I have a quick drink. Excuse me. Okay, so as you can see, the first and main role was the air defence of Malaya. Um, it wasn't the anti-terrorist campaign. That's actually the third in the sequence. Uh, cooperation and defence with Army and Navy uh, and the anti-terrorist campaign. So uh, the Australian elements were sent primarily for the air defence of Malaya. Uh, Singapore and British North Borneo, and not necessarily just to bomb jungle terrain. Um, but that's what panned out. Um, now, we had a, quite a few key Australians in these roles, unlike in World War II, where we didn't really have uh, senior Australian Air Force officers in charge of much. Um, when the Defence Committee considered what we would send to Malaya at uh, Prime Minister Menzies' behest, George Jones, who was the Chief of Air Force, absolutely insisted we should have Australian command. And certainly that was the case from Group Captain down. Uh, but we also alternated in the, in the uh, fairly important era uh, with the AOC Malaya. And you can see on the left Air Marshal Sir Frederick Scherger, um, who later became Chief of Air Force and then um, Chief of the Defence Force Staff. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Wallace Kyle, who was an Australian, but he was in the RAF. Uh, and he took over from Sherga, came back to Australia and became the governor of Queensland. So he had a distinct Australian connection. Anyway, so Valston Hancock, then the AOC Malaya, and after independence, they felt that um, calling the position AOC Malaya was very colonial. So they renamed it 224 Group. Now, during World War II, the RAF elements in Malaya as the Japanese attacked were in 224 groups. So they reformed the same group and that was more politically acceptable. Um, and after Sir Valston Hancock, it uh, then turned to be the RAF's turn, but Air Vice Marshal Ronald Ramsey Ray, uh, also an Australian, went to Point Cook in the between the wars period, got his wings at Point Cook, uh, went over with a number of other Australians for further training in England before the war uh, transferred into the RAF. So he actually wore RAF uniform, but he too was a, um, an Australian officer in that sense. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the Brits are famed for having hyphenated names, as you know, Foxley Norris and so forth for the senior officers. He decided that his name was really Ronald Ray um, and his middle name was Ramsey, but he decided in, um, before he became the AOC that it would be much more impressive if he called himself Ramsey Ray. And so he changed his name. Uh, he didn't get knighted, um, left in 62 and uh, retired to the UK. So they were the key commanders and there were others I'm not gonna go into, but um, they're covered in the Malayan Emergency book if you want to read about it. Okay, first thing is the Dakotas. Um, they were the first offered by the government, um, an easy solution to help their um, British comrades. Uh, they could easily be used for transport operations, for deploying um, forces, leaflet drops, as you can see in that lower picture, uh, and also um, supply drops to troops at the various forts that they established in the highlands. And um, consequently, they were very well used, but they were um, withdrawn too early, in my opinion, but that was the way Korean War had come into the play and the demand on transport operations there was much higher priority. Um, can you imagine being these chaps in the back of the Dakota, kicking out uh, 70 kilo packs parachute 
attached. Uh, they reckon they lost about five kilos each flight because of the uh, tropical weather and how heavy these packs. They had to lug them from the front of the aircraft, get them strapped to the back with the cable, kicked out with a parachute. So uh, pretty tough job. Now, they were army dispatchers. They weren't Air Force chaps, uh, but what a job that was. Um, now, this is a picture of a Dakota. It's a British one, uh, but it looks like it's got about four wheels under the wing there. They're actually loud speakers. Uh, they fitted high power transmitters, radio transmitters and, and speakers into the Dakotas and they broadcast propaganda messages in um, Cantonese, Mandarin, uh, Malay, uh, Tamil and so forth to uh, the various where they thought the communist camps were uh, telling them to surrender, telling them they'd be treated well and so forth. Um, that's called sky shouting. It's an interesting use of the, of the transport aircraft but as it turned out, we actually lent the Brits one of our Dakotas to do this. We didn't give them the crew, we just gave them an aeroplane, which I thought was rather extraordinary. We don't normally do that. Um, how effective it was, I don't know, but it continued right through to the end of the emergency um, with various British letters and other Hastings aircraft that were doing it. And of course, we have to come to the Lincolns. Um, after much request from, quite a lot of requests from the British, uh, Australian government relented and sent uh, initially a flight of Lincolns, uh, later the squadron, eight aircraft to Tanger. Uh, Tanger had a suitable runway and lots of um, loading areas and space on the tarmac. And they shared it with the British squadron. And in this picture, you'll see if you can look at it carefully, the aircraft on the right uh, is a British Lincoln. Uh, it's got a different serial number blasted down the side. I'm not sure how clear it is, but they did. So they were actually doing not only individual bombing runs, but they were also doing combined bombs, bombing runs with the British. Uh, and that's just a, a typical um, formation bomb drop. Um, Lincoln crew, um, quite labor intensive, tail gunner, a navigator, uh, a couple of pilots in the center, the chap with the mustache, the third from the left is the CO, Ken Robertson, towards the end of the time. Um, interesting fellow, we can talk about him some other time. Uh, a bomb aimer. Um, and two signalers, and the signalers also doubled as some um, gunners as well. So when you add that to eight aircraft, crews plus spares, a quite a large squadron, and then you've got, all, of course, all the ground crew and the maintenance troops. A pretty big effort. Um, there's the Bombay of a Lincoln. It can take 14,000 pounders if necessary, quite a large bomb load. Uh, and the picture on the right is a, one of the more successful bomb raids from a, an operation called Kingly Pile, where they claim to have killed 13 terrorists in the one raid. It's probably the most successful of all of them, uh, but very much um, quite expensive and a very, very um, heavy effort. But a nice pattern of bombing uh, across the jungle and um, done with some precision over an area target that no one knew whether there was a camp there or not. So how successful these were? Well, generally speaking, the assessment is not very. Um, and that's really what you saw from the aircraft. Uh, you do a low level bomb drop. What you do is you'd find two points on the map way, way before the target area that were identifiable. Then you'd line them up and then you'd start your bomb run from those identifiable points so you knew where the target area was. And you just timed the run, you flew at 180 knots, uh, so three miles a minute, and then you could easily work out basically when to drop the bombs. There was no aim point. There was no looking at camps. You couldn't see anything through the jungle canopy. Um, two squadron then arrived, mainly to support the Far East Strategic Reserve. A lot of things were changing um, politically in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, there was troubles in Vietnam. There was troubles in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, there was worries about uh, Thailand maybe getting um, uh, communist infiltrations. Uh, they weren't sure about Burma. Uh, Singapore had its own troubles as well with riots and so forth. So uh, part of Australia's contribution to the Far East Strategic Reserve was two squadron. And they sent the Canberras up to Butterworth. And they did a number of sorties before the confrontation, sorry, before the Malayan emergency was officially called off. Um, but a very important part of our deployment forward uh, and a very important presence in the region. Uh, now, how do we manage to get to Butterworth? Well, two ACS, two airfield construction squadrons spent um, the better part of three years completely redeveloping the old Butterworth base. Butterworth initially was a, um, a pre-war uh, RAF 
um, short aerodrome, which was used as almost like a, a satellite drone. It wasn't very um, substantial, uh, but it was in the right place. It was in the northwest of the country. So therefore it could jet project power into the Indian Ocean and up into Burma and so forth. Uh, but it very quickly fell to the Japanese and they, um, they bombed the airfield, but they repaired it to the extent where they could deploy their fighters. But after the war, um, it needed certainly a lot of work. Uh, it was used piecemeal by the RAF um, in the interim period between 45 and 55. Uh, but when it became more serious, the emergency, um, the Australian government agreed to redevelop the base uh, and they sent in the airfield construction squadron. They strengthened and, and uh, lengthened the runway. Uh, they built hangars, revetments, uh, loading areas, uh, um, squadron facilities, uh, and also um, accommodation. So the Butterworth base, which sort of I'm familiar with in my time, was really established back then. The picture there is actually not Australian Canberra's, it's an RAF squadron that deployed there um, once the airfield had been finished off, but you can see uh, there's still a lot of works in progress. And that's, um, we, we really take our hat off. We lost the airfield construction squadrons and that's a great shame. Um, and then of course, three squadron um, arrived as well, part of the Far East Strategic Reserve 58, and they lasted until 67 when they went home to, um, to convert to a Mirage. And number 77 squadron uh, a year later, and they too did the same thing. Now they would go back, the, the um, squadrons would go back to Butterworth, but that's beyond the scope of our little chat today. Um, I also say we sent the mobile control and reporting unit up to Butterworth during that um, latter phase, and they were fairly influential during the confrontation period. Uh, because the Indonesians uh, were just across the Straits of Malacca and, and bases at Medan and, and then Sumatra, and they were probing certainly Butterworth. So the radar was definitely used to give warning of any potential Indonesian raids. Uh, and it uh, remained there until 66 when it too came home. Uh, anyway, Medeca Day, uh, Freedom Day to the Malaysians or to the Malayans, uh, Independence Day to the British. Uh, was held in a stadium in Kuala Lumpur on the 31st of August 1957. And that's Tunkul Abdul Rahman proclaiming the new state of Malaya, uh, independent Malaya. And the two dapper chaps you can see with the rather excellent uniforms, I'd have to say. Uh, the fellow in the white is the Duke of Gloucester, who represented Her Majesty. And the fellow in the black, uh, admiral looking chap, is the governor of Malaya at the time. And there were a whole bunch of dignitaries and a huge crowd, of course. And the Malaysians still celebrate the 31st of August uh, as Independence Day to this day. So with that, um, the peninsula part of Malaya uh, got its independence, but there were some political wranglings about the states of Sarawak and Sabah, which were British colonial territories. Uh, and eventually the British signed them over and they became part of the um, Federation of Malaysia in 1963. Um, you'll notice that Brunei up there is still in that light tan color on the map. Uh, Brunei declined to join the Federation of Malaysia, they were asked, but the cunning Sultan decided that he liked his oil reserves and the money that generated uh, because it, um, it certainly suited his lifestyle and he didn't want to hand that over to some government in Kuala Lumpur. And so consequently, Brunei remains as a separate state. Um, so really, I don't know how much you can see of that, but I put this together in, in it's in the book because it, it needs to pan out just how involved in particular the Air Force was in Southeast Asia. Um, Malayan emergencies, the bit in the bottom here, that's the period, confrontations starts fairly soon after. But of course, Vietnam, we had Ubon. But if you look at the Southeast Asian treaties, they are considerable. ANZUS, CETO, Far East Strategic Reserve, ANZAM, AMDA, ANZUK, not to be confused with AUKUS, and uh, FPDA and IADS. And that's the legacy that the Malayan emergency, I believe, left in terms of our projection into the region and our fact that we're still there. Um, so not going to discuss that anymore, but it just seems to me that the Malayan emergency triggered a whole lot of those treaties and Australian commitments, Army, Navy, and Air Force. 
Um, in the interim, between the end of the emergency and the, you know, during the phase of the um, confrontation, which started in 63, Malaysian government requested Australia provide troops, um, transport, and helicopters. Um, and the helicopters were designed to basically support the Malayan armed forces in their um, anti-communist cross-border between Thailand and, and the Malaya incursions. What happened at the end of the emergency, those remaining communist terrorists who didn't either surrender or, or get killed, uh, retreated across the border into Thailand on the very border regions, which is still very remote and very jungly. Uh, and then they were still doing um, incursions into the northern states of Malaya uh, right through that period. And consequently, it was, it was a, a trial for the Malayan government to get troops in there and out. And so we sent uh, three helicopters up there to support them. Uh, and they actually got involved with ferrying troops around into various parts of Malaya during the confrontation because the Indonesians were threatening peninsula uh, Malaya as well as the um, Borneo part. So we acknowledge that five squadron was there. Um, they came back in 66 because um, the Australian government decided to commit them to Vietnam. And so it was uh, too hard to do a training squadron a squadron, a full squadron in Vietnam and to maintain three or four aircraft up in Malaya. So we brought them home, but they had, they played their part. Now, um, what happened next? Well, Indonesian President Sukarno got to power at the end of the war uh, and he lasted until March 67. Uh, an army strongman, um, certainly part of his uh, political um, backing was his persona as a tough guy. And when East Malaya and Malaya became Malaysia in 63, uh, he started what was called confrontation. And uh, that meant that there would be incursions by uh, Indonesian troops, sometimes dressed in, um, in civilian clothes, by the way, that would, would go across the border, create mayhem uh, with the intent to uh, stop what he thought was um, modern colonialism from the Malaysians. It was all part of his political ploy. Uh, catering to his, um, his country audience. Um, confrontation um, lasted until he was deposed, we'll come to that, but it did involve a hell of a lot of effort, mostly on the ground, mostly moving troops, uh, and mostly with British forces, and there was a considerable effort was put into uh, stopping cross-border incursions, both in uh, peninsular Malaysia and also in um, East Malaysia. Uh, and consequently, we also had patrol boats patrolling the area to stop infiltrations from the sea, uh, but mostly land effort with helicopter support. Um, now, I do point this map out. It's, um, it is Borneo, and there's an arrow there that shows this little tiny island. I can't see whether you can see it on the, on the picture, but it's, um, that's Labuan Island. And it became the main air base for air operations against the Indonesian incursions from uh, Borneo. And that's what it looks like. It's, uh, it's a single runway, a uh, little uh, domestic uh, hangar area, uh, not much to it, very flat. But there's a reason it was created. It was, it was initially a Japanese air base during the war. The Australians deployed considerably when we went north into the islands in 45. Uh, we expanded the base and it became a launch pad as we went west to, um, as pushing the Japanese forces out of Southeast Asia. Um, and it was ideal because it was an island, it was offshore, so very difficult if you've got patrol boats to infiltrate and to do damage from uh, the Indonesian army. And uh, it was produced, it, it was, it, excuse me, you could cover the whole of the uh, East Malaysia from that base because it's um, easy access. And there was a port area too, so you could bring in fuel, ammunition and so forth, resupply, whatever. Um, that's the luxurious accommodation. Just wanted to point out, it's not just the army that lived in tents, our guys did too. Uh, that's the ops room. Uh, you can see with the yellow post in front of it. Uh, they slept, ate, planned and flew uh, from there. And you can see on the ground is PSP, the perforated steel platform or pavement. The whole place was covered in that because of the rains would turn it into mud otherwise. And so they were on the edge of the airfield. So if you wanted to get any sleep and there was operations at night, you could forget it. Nevertheless, um, they lasted there mostly towards the end of confrontation. Um, stood on alert. This is a couple of barbed sabers. Uh, they've got 
uh, missiles loaded there, AIM 9Bs. Uh, it's they're ready to go. Uh, this is probably 10 minutes alert. The crews are not in the cockpit. Uh, but eventually, on a number of occasions, when there was intelligence that the Indonesians were coming with their bombers, uh, you had to sit in the cockpit. And um, a good idea was to have a parasol because you can imagine how hot and sweaty and sticky it would be. No air conditioning, no cockpit ventilation. Uh, but that's the way it was. And they were fully armed, fully loaded, uh, weapons pins removed from the weapons. So all you had to do was start and taxi and take off. And this was a regular occurrence. And so consequently, that's, um, that's why we employ fighter pilots. Um, interestingly enough, we also deployed a squadron of bloodhounds. We sent four of these um, missile launches to Darwin. Uh, Darwin was of course a major air base back then and still is. And we were worried that Indonesian bombers uh, from Java might strike Darwin. Uh, so they deployed these guys there for the period uh, until the end of confrontation. Uh, no bombers came, no missiles were fired, uh, but they went there anyway, that's 30, 30 squadron. Um, but consequently, Butterworth became a fairly important base. Uh, it's Penang Island in the background, but just beyond that, of course, is the Straits and beyond that is Sumatra. And these guys were regularly on alert. Uh, just off the picture to the left, the, um, the Brits had their fighter squadron. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of those in a sec. The British also felt that they could have put some deterrent factor into this and deployed Vulcan bombers. Now, whether they were nuclear armed, whether they were armed at all um, is open to conjecture. No one's ever said. Um, but the idea was if we had them there on the tarmac, it, and you can see there's a two squadron Canberra behind, so this is quite late in the period, um, it would be deterrent to any Indonesian incursions. Well, we know now that the Indonesians didn't even know they were there. So it's a question of whether they were effective or not, probably not. Um, but that was Butterworth's tarmac. Um, you can see one lot facing to the left, one lot, our lot facing to the right. Uh, for scramble purposes. And um, javelins here were night fighters, two seats, but had a big radar. Whereas our sabers were day fighters, they didn't have a radar in a single seat aircraft. So generally speaking, our guys ran alert during daylight hours and the Brits ran alert during the um, nighttime hours. Now, uh, did any engagements happen? Uh, yes and no. There were certainly lots of scrambles. There were certainly a couple of so-called intercepts. And um, allegedly, um, once again, it's still hard to find out, one of the javelins shot down an Indonesian Hercules after it had dropped troops into the peninsula of Malaya. The troops were pretty quickly captured, um, but the Indonesians lost a couple of Hercs in, um, in the confrontation. So we'll never know, I guess, until the uh, files are released or whether they actually shot them down or whether they just crashed on returning to, um, returning to Java. Um, confrontation um, essentially started to peter out after a coup. That's um, Suharto, uh, another general, major general at the time, got promoted, became the president. Um, afterwards, there was a bloody massacre. The communist elements in Indonesia were blamed on the coup. Uh, we now know that um, these guys um, fomented that, but they used it as a good excuse to clean out the, um, their opposition. And so we don't know how many thousand people were killed, but there was hundreds of thousands died. And um, that's the way it sort of ended. It took another um, almost a year before it officially was declared over, uh, but they didn't have, Sahato didn't have the, um, the heart to continue pressing uh, against East Malaysia in particular. Um, so what did it mean? It, mean, it meant that um, in that period between you know, 1960 to even the late early 70s, we had over a third of our air force deployed forward in the north part of um, in the Southeast Asia. Uh, there's, I don't know how clear they are, but basically you've got the fighter squadrons, you've got the bomber squadrons, and you've got transport and helicopters. And they do provide a substantial um, presence in that um, part of the world. Uh, and that means there's a fairly large commitment from Australia in terms of supporting our you know, friends and allies in Singapore, um, Malaysia, and um, to a lesser extent, Thailand as well. So 
with that, I'll conclude. I think I've taken about 50 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed it. But before I do, I just want to give you a couple of stats. You know, they ask about the bombers in um, the Lincoln bombers. Well, how many raids did they do? Uh, what did they do? How much did they cost? Well, the one squadron dropped 85% of all the bombs dropped during the emergency. Now, each 1,000 pound bomb costs 125 pounds. And when you drop 14 and a go in five aircraft raid, it quickly adds up to about 12 and a half thousand pounds per raid, which is a hell of a lot of money if you think about it in the 50s. So the commitment was certainly there in terms of expense and God knows how many millions um, it ended up costing. Um, total of 33,000 tonnes of bombs were dropped, uh, give or take a bomb, in over 4,000 sorties flown by one squadron. So a massive, massive effort. And for that, 23 CTs confirmed killed. So big questions have since been asked, was it worth it? It was ridiculous, it didn't do anything. But when you go back to the original Briggs plan, uh, I mentioned that the idea was to keep the terrorists on the move where they could be captured by the, the army and the police, uh, they were effective. So we'd have to say that. Um, casualties, uh, allied casualties, um, we lost 10 airmen uh, during the Malayan emergency. Uh, only one was from an aircraft crash, and that was a Dakota flying to Saigon to take some stuff up to Korea. And uh, it was an RAF aeroplane, but the co-pilot was an Australian who was on exchange. Uh, as for confrontation, uh, we lost one flying officer at Butterworth who was sadly killed in a motorbike accident. Uh, so that's that. All right. Um, I think it's stopped sharing. I hope it's stopped sharing. I hope you can see me again. Okay. That concludes our presentation today. I hope you have enjoyed it. So that was uh, terrific. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, really, really good. Um, I, I think I can remember taking my dad to the War Memorial on stage and uh, um, we asked one of the tour guides there to take us around where there'd been a display about the Mayan emergency. And my dad being very upset, but it was only one small corner. Yeah, one panel. And, yeah. Uh, it was very disappointing and he, he felt rather insulted by that. And uh, I think this has been, I think the Malayan emergency has been, has been maligned to some extent, you know, what did we achieve? What was it all about? Um, but I think the thing that brought it home to me was when you looked at the influence of the Air Force in Southeast Asia and the treaties that have extended since then, um, you know, it's not always on, on body counts and bombs dropped. It's, it's, the, it's the influence in the area. And um, I'd like to think that perhaps Australia, that we, we've taken that legacy and we still have um, an effective um, uh, influence within the region. Would you, would you say that we, we, still, we, we can still rely on that legacy? To yeah, some I mean, the, the Malayan emergency is not necessarily forgotten, but it's cast aside away. I mean, there was a lot of criticism probably in about the 1980s when people started to look at it uh, as to whether it was effective or not. Um, did we achieve anything? Uh, the book that the Air Force published actually has, I put down sort of the pros and cons on the fence sitters. Now, there's a lot of folks that said it was really good, achieved its aims. We got the communist terrorists out of the jungle. They all surrendered. Um, you know, a lot of the other guys said, well, we killed thousands of monkeys and destroyed thousands of trees and killed a lot of birds. Uh, for what? Uh, and you, there's no sort of answer to either of those things. You really don't know. Uh, the fence sitters, well, I guess they want, there's always those in politics that have a bet on it, bet each way. Um, it did leave a lasting legacy. I'm, I must say, that's, that was sort of the gist of my last slide there. We, we ended up in Southeast Asia, and we still go there from time to time. We're not based there anymore. We have a rotation into Butterworth and so forth on, on agreement. And we do a lot of exercises and training with the Malaysians and the, and the Indonesians now too. Um, but during that period from sort of the late 50s to the, um, you know, even the late 70s, um, we were there all the time. Uh, when I was going up there flying Herx in the late 70s, we'd have a regular Hercules courier that went to Tanga and then up to Butterworth. Uh, it would spend, you know, a few days there, do some stuff and come home again. But that was regular once a, once a week or once a fortnight. Uh, two fighter squadrons based there permanently and their crews. Uh, they do a rotation to Tanga. Uh, you know, six aircraft would go down there on a regular three-month deployment. Uh, we had a um, transport support flight, uh, which was Dakotas, but they used to fly all around Southeast Asia, providing diplomatic liaison, 
uh, troop transport um, and so forth, rescues of crashed, not crash, but broken airplanes that would <laughs> had landed somewhere else and so forth. And, you know, and more lately, of course, P3 deployments into, um, into Southeast Asia for South China Sea and Indian Ocean patrols. So that all adds to our, not only our presence, but our will to support um, Malaysia and Singapore. And well, despite all the politics and the rhetoric about, you know, disagreements at the political level, military to military, we all get on pretty well. We all understand our business. And the military guys know that there's a reason we're there and we do help them when, and, and as for, you know, taking secrets and stuff and spying, well, all those claims are already made, but quite frankly, it's a lot of rubbish because in a lot of those um, flights, we'd actually take you know, Malaysian Air Force officers with us on a flight like that. Um, yeah, so it, it left a lasting legacy. What, what for the future? Well, who knows? But certainly, uh, we still deploy P3s into into um, Butterworth for the for the reason that we contribute to the Western Alliance, and looking at illegal fishing. Uh, we're keeping an eye on some certain friends to the north of there, of course, and what they're doing in the South China Sea. Uh, we're interested in what's going on in the Indian Ocean, whereas we sort of let the Indian Ocean slip in my mind. Um, and it's become more and more important, as we know, with the recent announcement with the submarine deal. I don't think we're going to come, <clears throat> go out of that part of the world in the near future. I think we're going to continue to be there. Anyway, I'm happy to take questions if anybody's got yeah, any. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah, yes, I'll, Warwick. Yeah, I'll let Marianne do the question answer thing and I'll answer. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Warwick, go ahead. Yeah, Warwick. So, it used to be RAF Butterworth and RAAF Butterworth. It's yep. Just basically Royal Malaysia, or the Malaysian Air Force Butterworth now, is it? Yeah, no, what happened was we, um, I can use the term, sold the base to the Malaysian, I think it was in 1972 or 71, I can't <laughs> remember the date. It cost one Malay ringgit. <laughs> Maybe it was a bit later, maybe it was in the early 80s. But anyway, we handed it back to the Malaysians. Um, it became just a transit base to us. And eventually, of course, they took over things like the messes and we don't, we don't stay on the base anymore. We go to a hotel in town. Of course, like you should, Air Force, do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was all part of the political arrangements. Um, it was RAF Butterworth. It then became Air Base Butterworth. It then became RAAF Base Butterworth. Then... RAAF Butterworth and now RMAF Airbase Butterworth. <laughs> yeah. They are for the Royal Malaysian um, Royal Family or something? The Royal Malaysian Air Force. That's good. RMAF. Oh, yes. Yeah, Royal... Malaysian. yeah no, the Royal Malaysian Air Force, yeah, because the Sultan is still, you know, notionally. It's like the British Queen and you know, versus the, uh, the British government. It's a situation like that. Uh, they still defer to the sultan or the and the, the the sultans i gather take it in terms to become the grand poobah in terms of the malay states i'm not sure how it works politically but there's some arrangement but it's the royal malaysian air force yes uh, lloyd you had a question oh hi uh yes i i, I was really intrigued with your presentation that's wonderful um i, I served two tours with 36 squadron mm. from 1960 to 67 and uh, it's interesting that many people talk about the assistance that the transport squadrons, as 37 to, uh, supplied during, even at the end of the um, yeah. Malayan emergency, when it was up in the north with the from yeah. incursions from Thailand. Um, and we, we did a lot of, lot of support uh, carrying troops, including the New Zealand Army, which doesn't seem to get a mention much. Uh, yeah. and, um, 36 Squad was very involved with uh, that and certainly through confrontation. And Absolutely right. Um, yeah. Yep, that's the baby. We cover them off quite nicely in the, in the book. Um, yeah, we got the Herx, the A models arrived in, I think, 58. And they yeah, were. They I, were I, I've tried, transferred to uh, Herx in uh, at the end of 58. Yeah. I'm a brand new. Yeah. What a what a change in terms of our strategic lift capability from Dakotas oh, yeah. to C-130s. And now, of course, C-17s as another jump forward again. Um, but those airplanes... And the one are still going. For this yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, they were used definitely to supply Lab 1 and the, and the bases in, um, yep. in, in Kuching in, in um, Borneo. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, you've, you've got a question there. 
yes, just unmute myself. Um, first of all, Mark, um, fantastic presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's great. Um, I want to go back. I've got a, two questions actually. The first one is I want to go back to right near the beginning where you talked about the four Australians who are part of the emergency and that. Mm -hmm. from Fred Sugar right through to Ronald Ray. Oh, yep, yep. Now, you mentioned Ronald Ray, uh, Australian members in the RAF. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I've got the right person. Um, I've been researching a bit about that area of the of the um, RAF before the war. Mm -hmm. Would Ronald Ray have um, embarked from Australia in late 31 and joined, done a four-year commission um, starting in early 1932? And eventually getting a permanent commission about 36, something like that. Does that sound that'd be absolutely right? right. I'll just read what I've written about him because okay, you know, I've covered him off what I've done in the book. Right. But by the way, I, I don't get any royalties or payment for these, so I, I'm not flogging it. Um, but each of the main commanders, I've put a little bio down, and uh, he passed right. away in 1994, actually, born in 1910. Um, he was the first RAF officer to hold the position of the AOC 224 group after, after Bell Hancock. Um, although a member of the RAF, he had been born in Sydney and earned his wings at Point Cook, as I mentioned, yep. along with many other pilot graduates. He was sent to Britain for further training and transferred to the RAF in 32. Uh, he served as commanding officer of RAF Tanger at the start of World War II and was captured by the Japanese in Java. Uh, during so he was escape. captured, so, was he? Yes, he was. He became a prisoner of war. Right. Uh, he remained in the RAF post-war, changing his name to Raider Ramsey Ray after various postings in the UK, including Deputy Air Secretary, he was appointed AOC um, 24 group before he retired in 1962. So I was surprised because I didn't realize that he was, he was Australian until I started researching this. Yep. Um, so it's interesting because originally the British held all the senior appointments. Commander in chief was always a British um, air marshal. The AOC up until uh, the time that Sherger was appointed was always a British air vice marshal. Uh, and there must have been some deal done about um, support and the fact that we were putting in such an effort to agree to Australian officers holding that command appointment. And so it alternated. And of course, it was Sherger, RAAF, um, Wallace Kyle, RAF, Hancock, RAAF, Ramsey Ray, RAF. And, and in the 60s, um, Frank Hedlam, who was also an Australian, also held the position, but I didn't really cover that latter period. Uh, all of them are listed in the, um, in the in the book there. If you need to do some further research, it's a, it's available. Right. Mary Ann can probably tell you how we can get those. Um, well, that was going yeah. to be my second question: How do you get the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send out a, a, um, a link, everyone, so that you can. Uh... Yeah, it was right. a Thank it you, was Mary. an interesting challenge. I'm, I don't know if you're interested, but it, um, years ago I was asked to speak when I was a wing commander at a, one of the Air Forces history conferences, and they said, "Oh." Um, we want you to talk about the Malayan emergency. And I went, mm, the what? <laughs> and uh, so I wrote a paper on that. And that then got picked up a number of times. And, they, and then uh, the Air Force said, look, we're doing this campaign series. And if you don't know those folk out, that, out there that might not know, uh, more recently under um, Air Commodore John Meyer and Group Captain Dave Fredericks, uh, the Air Force has started to publish a bunch of a, a campaign series. And um, I don't know how well you can see that, but this is the second. Oh, yes. Was, there was one written about Operation Okra, which is the F-18s against ISIS, and that's the first one. Um, you know, it's that thick. And um, they asked me to, to expand on it. And I said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm getting to Okra. That's the first one. Thanks for it. And there's a, the intent now is to have a series of these come out each year. Uh, and I'm not sure what's next cab off the rank, but it's various authors have been asked to um, put them together. So you'll see that I think they're on the Air Force's website, aren't they, Marianne, or, or the Air Oh, they will be soon. Or the History and Heritage website, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, the, and I started researching it probably about two years ago. Um, and I said, oh, I don't think it's going to be enough to put a book together. Well, it turned out it's now, you know, it's ah, 282 pages. Book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the other thing that people will find useful are the appendices. Uh, all the Air Force Honours and Awards, all the, you know, the role of honour, including a little bio about each of them, all the RA, the Air Force squadrons and the commanding officers are all listed. So I wanted to leave something which in future, 
um, families or people that were looking at this in later years would actually have a great source to start with. Uh, that's kind of me. I'm a bit of a fanatic for sort of detail, even though I still do typos as Jenny's laughing her head off in the back there. <laughs> so is Despina. <laughs> um, they're the same. Uh, it's the Air Force training that does that for you, I think. So yeah, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting challenge. Despina, over the last few years, Jenny's uh, Christmas present has invariably been an Air Force history book. <laughs> and, and an excellent present. <laughs> provided uh, for free by uh, Group Captain Frederick. <laughs> actually, an excellent present, if I'd have to say myself. <laughs> um, I actually did have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead. The, the British uh, decision to move from east of Suez, um, yep. it sort of didn't get a mention in, in your talk, but did it have any impact on what was happening and what our uh, contribution was? I think it did. 1971, they announced it in the... Um, the British white paper, the defence white paper of, I think, 1966. Yes, they did. Um, it was, if I'm correct, the uh, Wilson Labor government in England at the time, mm -hmm. uh, totally focused on, you know, the transition to Europe. And, of course, they announced the European Economic Community joining in 72. And, of course, then, you know, budget pressures started to, um, you know, erode. And the idea of having a, a force spread across the globe um, didn't suit that particular government. Now, if you think about it, um, there was an old saying in, in the RAF that if you were an excellent upright officer, you served in England. Um, if you'd had a few little misdemeanors in your distant past, they sent you to Europe. But if you were a cad and bounder, they sent you to the Far East. <laughs> and somewhere in the middle, the Middle East <laughs> group, <laughs> And so consequently, the Far East was seen as a sort of remote territory that really didn't have too much to do. But unfortunately for those guys, Malaya in particular was critical to British post-war redevelopment and paying off their debts uh, because of the rubber, palm oil and tin. Now, you had the Korean War start. And what did the Americans need? They needed rubber for tyres. They needed tins for rations and ration packs. Uh, they needed palm oil for cooking. And it, Malaya and the colony in Malaya was a huge source of um, exchange revenue to help the Brits pay off their lend-lease um, money. So in that sense, in that part of the that time frame, they couldn't get rid of it. But by the 70s, uh, a lot had changed. Um, Europe had, had become the European, well, not quite the European Union, but they were headed towards it. British had joined the European Economic Community and told Australia to, you know, farmers to get lost, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the focus was clearly on the Atlantic and the cross-Atlantic um, you know, relationship with the United States and to a lesser extent Canada. So the politics is a huge in this matter. And uh, by 1970, uh, by 1972, most of the Brits had left, um, certainly in Malaysia, and, and I think the last were those ones in Tenga. There was an official handover ceremony where for a short while we ran Tenga Air Force Base before the Singaporeans took it over and then booted us out because it's now their secret fighter base and they didn't want Australian spies running around over the place. But I'm pleased to say that my name tag is on the uh, back bar in the officer's mess in Tanger. I hope it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> For those that were ever there, the trick was you take your name tag off and you'd find a spot on the wall or on the roof or on the bar to stick it. And so there was thousands of names of their crew. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was a privilege to go there, but uh, it's a very different world now. Yeah. Uh, the other quick question I had was, um, Singapore was in the Federation for mm. months. Um, did that, uh, you know, was, was that just them politicking that uh, who, somebody got thrown out and somebody left at, uh, at their own accord? Or did that have any impact at all? Uh, Tom Cole, Abdul Rahman and Lee Kuan Yew had a lot of disagreements about the the role of Singapore in the Federation. I mean, Singapore left in 65, yeah. middle of 65, uh, went its own way. And of course, a fairly large Chinese population, Singapore, of course, whereas Malaysian's government is tends to be very focused on Malays for Malaysia. Um, the other races tend to struggle a bit to get any position of influence. Um, even that's not changed too much from my reading now. Uh, to get promoted into the senior ranks of the armed forces, you've got to have a, a Malay background, occasionally a, 
a Chinese guy gets to wear Commodore. But yeah, so there was disagreements politically. And uh, I don't know the full story. I haven't gone into that, the political arrangements that were made. Uh, but it was an, a mutual agreement to separate. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like we had a dummy spit and we're just leaving. That There was a lot of talks beforehand. Uh, and look how Singapore has now pro progressed. And of course, a lot of the Chinese merchants that didn't want to stay in Singapore went to Penang, which is why Penang is also now a fairly progressive um, little economy in its own right, that state. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, Warwick. Yeah, a bit of a plug uh, for this new series of books, the Australian Air Campaign series, of which Armageddon and Okra is number one. Uh, I'm halfway, literally halfway through the book, finished last night up to the end of the World War One stuff in Palestine. Very, very interesting read because that area is not generally, or that area of operations, it's not, not generally well known. And it's amazing to see all the operations that uh, number one squadron, Australian Flying Corps, was doing there. Yeah. Uh, got superiority in. We got uh, whipped out of Gallipoli, of course, but by golly, we whipped the Turks in the end and they just about annihilated the whole army down there. Yeah, that's another good story. It's worth a read. Um, yeah, the, the intention with the campaign series, from what I gather, is that some of those lesser known um, campaigns that haven't been covered in well in the past uh, will be looked at. Um, I think there's some a Vietnam series in planning. I'm not sure the angles there. I don't know who's doing that, but it's sort of being thought of. Um, the Air Force has now revamped its publication program. Uh, in my opinion, for years and years, we left who I call gifted amateurs do our history. Um, you know, there's lots of really great books out there written by people who've never been in the Air Force and never served. And I think the Air Force thought, well, hang on a minute, we're reaching 100 years anniversary this year. Uh, we need to lift our game. And it's only fair that airmen and airwomen put their mind to putting something down in, in paper. Because, you know, we'll come and go, we'll pass on eventually, but the books last forever, uh, you know, pretty much. Mm. Uh, and it's always interesting to revise and relook at um, some of these campaigns because as more facts, figures and documents are released, um, you know, we're getting sort of revisionist history in the positive sense where they've said, oh, we thought this happened, but no, this is what really happened. Uh, and that's the thing about a lot of these uh, World War II bomber command books, for example. There's a whole lot of them come out now because these guys are realising they're not immortal and they want to capture their story. But they were a 20-year-old flying officer or sergeant pilot, and they could never have imagined what was going on at the higher levels. They were just busy surviving. And this is what's happening now. We're now seeing the higher-level stuff, the command issues, the politics, you know, the arrangements that were made, why deals were done. Uh, they're, they're coming out now, and it's, it's, it's giving us a fascinating another look uh, of what went on back then. Mm. Mm. Um, a couple more. Uh, Lloyd, you've got a question, and then we'll go to Gordon. Uh, speaking about books and uh, written by people who were there, I published a book three years ago that is not, has not sold very well at all. So I just bought a few hundred copies and I just give them away. And that's the book. Ah, okay. Yeah, I've never seen it. If somebody, oh. if somebody would like to email me their email address, I'll send them a free copy. Yeah, there you go. We'd like to certainly have it for the Air Force History section collection. Yeah, we have. We've got one. We've got one. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. we've got one. Yeah. 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 So if anybody else wants their own copy, I'll, I'm happy to, to forward one to them. Yeah, look, I'll tell you what, Lloyd, I've done the same thing. I started publishing my own books because no one, would, no publisher would take any of them. Yeah. Um, so I thought, play this. I'll just pay the money and did it. Um, who, who benefits? Well, I personally benefit, but that's mm. not the point. It's the families. Yep. You know, those squadron histories I wrote for, for World War II, 464, 454, um, 462, uh, they've all been picked up by the families who said, oh, thank you, because Grandpa never spoke about it. We didn't know what he did. What do all these medals mean? Why did, you know, and it's really been very rewarding. So I don't do it for money. I just do it because I love this stuff. Yep. I mean, exactly. for goodness sake, some people race cars. How the hell could you be bothered with that when you can write history books? Yep. <laughs> Or collect stamps, for example. Uh, <laughs> Gordon, you've got a question or a comment there? Yes, uh, a, a bit of both. Um, just following up that last point, um, Mark, um, mm -hmm. about those um, 
those books well about you doing it uh, i've done the same thing i wrote mm. a book about um 78 squadron raaf mm-hmm. that was in the southwest pacific area yep. called this smutty squadron yeah and once again um i got rejected by all the best publishers i think i got rejected by everybody self-published and you're right you do it for those people i mean uh, and, and it comes back to you in terms of one guy from the squadron rang me up one day. I'll never forget. We were actually away on holidays walking on the beach. And he rang mm. me and said, I've just got your book. I've bought 10 copies wow. to give to my kids yeah, so that yeah. they know what I went through. Mm. And it was just, you know, it was probably the pinnacle of writing the book for me anyway. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And that. I agree. And that, yeah, it, it's it's very rewarding in that sense because you feel mm. a oh, sense of achievement. You've, you've helped somebody fill in part of their family history that they otherwise would never have known about. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Um, um, the other thing was um, the, that um, series of books of which you've written a second one. Um, I must have to get both of them, I think, now. Um, you were saying it's been written. Is it only going to be written by people from the, from the Air Force or... No. Not, not so just no, gifted amateurs, so. as you said, can do it as well. well. Yeah, I think it, it, the, the um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marianne, but the history and heritage section have got a publishing cell and they have a series yes. in mind. So there's sort of three tiers. There's tier one, uh, which is sort of a higher level um, books like the one I did on um, called Taking the Lead, the history of the Air Force from 72 to 96. That was, right. and that was, I guess, my magnum opus. It's, you know, that's tier one, tier two, and these are tier three. Um, I'm not sure, what t- I can't remember what the tiers are. Maybe Despina remembers what they are. But the Air Force has now got a, a five-year program for publishing. Uh, now that depends on the authors getting off their backside and writing it. And, and, yes. it ed- and we will do, we the Air Force will do the proofreading. Uh, and there's, you got you got to accept that. A lot of people think their grammar and their spelling is the best ever, but generally speaking, someone else is going to trash it with red (laughs) writing. Uh, So it goes through an editorial process and then it's professionally developed by a commercial company and they've got a contract with Big Sky, who are the, who are one of the um, the publishing companies in Australia that still do this stuff. Um, Yeah. And that's, Big Sky started off doing the army campaign series. And I think that's where we got the idea. So there is a plan. There is a sort of a schedule. Um, some of these will slip if people are running late or some of them will come early when there's a gap. But generally speaking, they're going to have a couple of these come out every year, I think. Uh, and it's a good thing too. I mean, the Air Force is 100. We need to capture a lot of these stories, whether people want to read them or not, it's another matter because even if you don't, somebody else does. Um, yeah, that's my view on this. And if we don't capture a lot of those things now, well, they'll be gone. Um I was lucky when I did the Malayan emergency because I had to do that presentation for the Air Force History Conference in about like 1994 or something. I wrote to a couple of dozen veterans who were still well and truly alive and very fit and healthy then. And I got some great letters back. And a lot of those letters are quoted in this because they were there. They can tell me what it was like flying over the jungle and whether they thought it was a waste of time or what. (laughs) And so if we don't capture these stories now, um, they'll be gone. I mean, Graham Dyke, he was a yeah. classic. He was one of my uh, helpers. And, you know, I mentioned him before he passed on this last week. Yeah. Um, we've got a program within the branch as well. But um, if someone has written a book and they'd like us to oversee it, uh, as um, Mark said, to do some editorial work on it. Um, and if we think it's good, what we'll do is we'll get a senior officer to write a forward to the book. And we'll give you permission to give the writer the permission to use the uh, the RAF crest. So that's another tier, um, you know. And, and that, of course, will boost any sales of the books. If people see a RAF crest on it, or, you know, and then it's a forward, so written by you know someone like um, uh, like Mark. So you spread the word there. So um, we're happy to do right. that. Yeah, yeah you is, don't, is that something yeah. that Fredo's involved with too? Yeah, yeah. he's, he's yeah. 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 Just just before we go, if you're interested in five five um sorry four five four squadron, which was a Baltimore squadron in the Mediterranean, yep. um, I gave the rights to put it up on their website. You can download it as a PDF if you'd like to read it uh, for free. Um, so you need to go to the four five four four five nine squadrons association website, uh, and um, you can download it as a pdf file and 
complete as it's as published so it's got pictures all that stuff and i did that because hey i printed a print run i don't know how many printed 500 um the family got my you know, family's got most of them I thought hey i'm never going to get another run so um why not and funnily enough about a year ago someone said oh are you interested in reprinting that <laughs> and when they found out it was on the website they said oh no we've changed our mind <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, right. what I said earlier about sending people books, I'm quite happy to send PDF copy of my book to anybody that wants to email. Yeah. Um, I, I'd also send them a copy of my novel, which has a lot of flying stuff in it. Mm. Well, but rather than a whole lot of emails, what about, Lloyd, um, and, uh, if you email me and I'll go out to the friends uh, and say where, where, where uh, we can get the 454 squad and book, where we can get where uh, you can um, purchase them alone and purchase a book from um, Mark. And, I don't know how uh, and then I can send it out to all the yeah. friends. How's that? I don't think it's very much. How much? Do you know how much the book is selling? For this one, the Malayan one. I don't know. I have it in my other office. Yeah, no, it's, it's not. It's not very expensive. I hope not because it doesn't need to be. I'd rather it gets out than. Yeah. Do you want me to send you PDF copies of the book? Yeah, okay. If you're happy with that, then I can I can I can send a link or something out. Yep. But let's, let's talk about it offline. Yep. And then um, and then I can do it that. But what I will do, um, if you bear with me till next week. I'll do up a little bit of a list of people that want to, um, uh, you know, where we can link into uh, the, the book where you can buy books, or whatever, so I can have yeah. a look at it. Okay. So, yeah. Now, just uh, just um, uh, let you know, it's just a small project that I'm working on at the moment with a small team over at um, at ADFA, uh, University of New South Wales ADFA. Um, our team leader is Dr. Robert Hall, one of the adjunct professors there, and. Uh, we're working with, we're doing an interactive Bomber Command website. So um, over the last mm -hmm. 18 months, we've been collecting, building on the data that I collected from my, um, my doctorate. And um, we're, we're, we're given a DVA grant to do it. So we were um, planning to present in October, but because of COVID, some, we've had um, some delays in getting target maps and that sort of thing. So I'll keep you posted on that. Um, so hopefully that will be, we'll present to DVA uh, probably March next year and see if we can get that up and running. So if any of you have any Bomber Command connections, again, please um, please let me know and I'll be very happy to talk to anyone. mary talk to me offline. I've got hundreds of photos and maps. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, sir. That's good. Okay, then. So look, thank you very much, everybody. Um, have a great weekend. Um, and... Uh, we, we've got a couple of good uh, uh, presenters lined up for the next couple of months for November, December. And boy, even during lockdown, hasn't this year gone quickly? So, um, and we've had a whole lot of great presentations this year, and uh, it's been terrific. We've been just been distributing all of the the newsletters from the Aviation and Historical Society. So, thank you very much, one and all, Queensland, New South Wales, Victorian gang. It's just been fantastic, actually. They're terrific reads. So. Uh, there was no need to get bored even on lockdowns. Anyway, if that's if that's it, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you once again, and um, we'll see you soon. <laughs>